to our first Swiss superstar of today. A big applause, please. Tom Strala from Zurich. Thank you so much. Hello, Belgrade. Um, do you hear me? It's okay? I'm Tom Strala, designer from Switzerland, and I really appreciate to be here in this wonderful country. And I want to thank Jovan and also his staff that you brought me here to this place, and also that you had the courage to choose a topic like this. I mean, in our profession, we talk a lot about fancy stuff, but not about sense, the question of essence. So look at this beautiful building. Today must be the day I have to thank everybody, now first Johan and now you, because if I stood here in the 15th century and would have said the same thing, look at this beautiful building, I would probably have received another reaction from you than I received from you now. Or can you imagine that a man from the 15th century would have looked at this building and said, wow, what an amazing house, that he saw an architectural or social idol inside. How does it come that living like little bees in a, in a, in a honeycomb is, is, is like, uh, becomes an architectural example or a pattern? Was that not just once perceived as, as plump and poor? And now we see formal quality in, in this building. I mean, this is for me absurd. If you take this class, for example, this glass is the, is, is the, still gla uh, the same glass that it was five minutes ago, and it will be the same glass in another five minutes. So this glass will not have a bling bling, and then it's an iPhone or something like that. This glass will not catch an idea to turn into something else. And this is the reason why this building must have something more than just this physical matter. And in this building, it was the, the spirit of the, the modern human who took a lot about, uh, took a lot care about resources. And uh, he, he built a lot of people together that they can let the, the nature in its original beauty around the house. For example, here, Le Corbusier built uh, 340 apartment on a, on a ground of 3,400 square meters. And if each of these owner or, or resident of this apartment would have built a, a very little house, let's say 10 by 10 meter, this would be a huge area of 34,000 square meters. And Le Corbusier built only 10% of that, and the rest we can give back to nature. But Corbusier made some more thought. He also, he also built this building on, on these pillars so that we gain the main floor. And he made the uh, flat roof so we can do there also a roof garden. The modern spirit is more than just this thought. It's, it's also the, the social thought which, um, that when people build together, uh, we can give more comfort to, to each individual. Um, simply said, one, one wall defines two apartments and not only one. So here you can see that a that, uh, natural ideal gives the hand to a social thought and, and efficiency. And of course, is Le Corbusier a big master of realization? But what is more important or interesting than, than this is that it's just um, the spirit or the mind which made this building to what it is. So it seems that, that we can only see what we know. I have here another example for that. So I think the most of you have looked already into the sky and, and looked for some images in, in the clouds. I personally see here a, a skeleton, x-ray image of a skeleton. But the point is, if I never had seen an x-ray image in my life, I probably would have seen nothing. So it seems that we need a, a code which uh, makes us sensible to see or to perceive things, and then, when we have this code, we can see great architectural art in that because we understand that it is not trivial. In the meantime, 
we have a different relationship to, to function or to utility. And in, in form follows function, we, we see something beautiful. And for example, this, this, uh, this cyclist, his, <laughs> okay, this cyclist, uh, his goal is to, to be faster and everything what makes him faster uh, makes sense for him. So he, he makes his material lighter and thinner or more aerodynamic and he, he, uh, he trains his muscle, his power, he also optimizes his food. So everything what, what makes him faster on a certain distance makes perfect sense for him. So form follows function makes also sense for him. And today we see in the reduction of, um, we see in function the reduction of, of the essential or, or the, the true or the, 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 uh, the pure core which is visible in its full beauty. So today we are able to see something meaningful, uh, as, as we can see something sensual in something meaningful, sorry. Um, but there are also objects which celebrate technique without actually being functional motivated. So at this house from Pierre Charol, you see this, this facade uh, with, with this prefabricated repeatable bricks uh, presents efficiency. These columns in the interior with the, with the studs uh, remains on an industrial building. And we have a mechanical ventilation system here. Complex retractable stairs. <coughs> Walls can be moved. We have a lot of furniture and objects which, which are convertible and change their form in an aesthetic way. Everywhere we can roll or we can rotate or we can, can unfold stuff. And there are a lot of doors and some of these doors can completely change the room. And some of these doors has even the, fun has even the formal quality than a Calder or a Giacometti has. So this is all very interesting and also fascinating, but does that all make sense? So why do we need an extra ventilation system to bring fresh air into our house? Or why do we need all these this, uh, folding tables? It's, it's, it's not the, the little apartment where we are all very happy to have some intelligent furniture. It's a monstrous villa. So here it's not the pragmatic uh, function which, which determines the shape. Um, it's uh, like in the example for, uh, before from the cyclist. So here it's the, the will of the architect who celebrates technique without a functional need. And what arised here, I mean, for me, it's amazing because for me, it's, 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 it's like a living machine which can be changed according to the owner's wish and it contains for me something like a human longing nearly a madness which, which um, expand the definition of function into a new dimension. And I think uh, Charot has, has moved uh, a border of imagination and he has soaked that matter with, with his spirit. We can compare that with, with, a, with a poet who wants to write a poem just with letters. So he can he can, as a cyclist race, he can, can line up the ladders so, and he can look which one will wins the race, so A, B or L, but he can spend years to, to, uh, to look which ladder will win the race or, or 
which one is the best, but never a problem will arise. But fortunately, he has also the possibility that he can make an arrangement, and suddenly uh, an arrangement correspond to, to a blah blah, and this blah blah has, has a more, has, um, is ex expresses more than, than each single character, and this blah blah becomes more and more differentiated, so that it makes words which are more and more, um, have more and more sense, and these words which have more and more sense makes words which are more and more flexible. So these flexible words, we can arrange together two sentences which make more and more sense. And this is a kind of evolution. And at the end, we get a poem which um, is so differentiated because it can say so many things and has so many dimensions. A lot of people think that, that an artist can just let his work flow, that he, he can bring something out of himself because he's a genius or so. For sure, we can be the, the source of a creation, but, but we have to reflect on what we produced. So um, it's not just done when we bring something out of us self um, because what's coming out can be something bad or false, like barf. And in other words, the poem we wanted to write has no other dimension. So if you look at this, this uh, memory stick, it's a memory stick in a finger cover, it's really uh, funny, it's fascinating because it has something to do with us human. It's a, it's a part of our body, it's a, it's a part of our arm, a hand, a hand we can say hello to somebody or a finger we can put or take or pull stuff. And this is all in this memory stick as a message. But there is also another message in this memory stick because I can really easily imagine how a meat man has, has divided this finger into uh, with, with a butcher's knife. So, this brutality is also inside this memory stick. Anyway, it's a humanization of a commodity and in that manner, it goes into a relationship with the observer. And when it goes into the relationship with the observer, it wants to tell us something. But what wants to tell us? Does it say, take me out of one computer, put me into another one that I can download some data? I don't think so, because for me, the form and, and also the, the, the material is too unsensual. And also, this, this hidden message is for me too disgusting. So for me, this memory stick says, I'm from a gift shop of a horror cabinet. And there, I can really e easily imagine that, that they can sell it like French fries. But this is not the question. The question is, if I produce or develop an object, what kind of feeling do I want to evoke? And then I have to ask myself, is it right to make a commodity which costs me a lot of overcoming to, to touch or to, to hold in my hands, which, which has a form like, like agar for bacteria or so, and has a message um, which has nothing to do with its nature? To be honest, it, it, it confusing me with an abstruse story. So it's undisputable that this memory stick is a, is, a, is a joke, but it's also a fast joke. A joke which is over when we have bought it. Uh, take a, a party bomb we have at New Year's Day is also a fast joke like this. But the, the paper hearts you throw away the next day and the memory stick is, is still in use in another year. So, I want to com compare this, this memory stick with another object. It's also a humanization of a commodity, and it's a car from, from Erwin Wurm. So in, in the meaning or in the opinion of Erwin Wurm, cars and homesteads are the central fetish of our modern human being. And this is exactly what he shows in his word. So if you look at this, this car, uh, you can easily see that, that he made a lot of thoughts about the transformation or 
this expansion process. So in opposite to the memory stick, it's a humanization of its nature and not uh, one by one uh, translation of an existing image. So the idea of getting fed is here important and not just make an application like a fat belly on the engine hood. So with the work of Erwin Wurm, he makes us reconsider. And for me, he says something really essential that our common and elementary needs getting really fast transmitted into a kind of, of perversion or fetishism. And It's not only skinniness or this obsession with beauty which affect to that, it's also our object fetishism. And each generation has, has, has its own perversion and also its own fetish. And they are blind to see this fetish because, because they are involved in it. So this car is for me, even if it has a lot of humor, it's, it's not a fast joke. For me, it's a, it's a timeless piece of art. What you see now, if we compare this, 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 uh, this uh, car with the memory stick, that material is always a transmitter of an idea. It doesn't matter if you make, make a memory stick in the finger cover or this fat car. It doesn't matter if you, you make an uh, existing plastic chair just in wood instead of, of plastic. Always we ha it has a message. And this is the reason why I think um, everything is a materialized idea and this is not the question because for me the question should be is it an intelligent materialization or not. So now we have, we have a little problem because um, this car from Erwin Wurm criticizes exactly for what the, the Maison de Verre stands for. It criticizes our, our elementary needs which which are getting transformed into a kind of perversion. And what does that mean now? Does that mean that the maison ware is no art anymore? For me, not. Because for me, both of these objects are, are um, moved, moved the border of imagination and, and have some great thoughts inside. And this is the reason for me why this, this objects stand side by side and not against each other. So even if I said before that it's very important that we reflect on what we produce, I think also it's very necessary that we don't this one, one, one great performance flat by the other one because otherwise we live in a, in a kind of this, this lowland pluralism which has no up and no downs, and everything is almost okay. For me, it's the, the spirit who makes the matter to what it is and not reverse. And you can also see that when, when you try to turn something dead into something alive, we get a lot of problem. Probably we can, can, can do a robot or, or something like that. But, but when we try to make uh, uh, Frankenstein's patchwork with, with dead body parts, this remains a fantasy. So the question is, how can we soak matter with spirit? And for me, it's, it's important to go into the matter and that we are willing to, to ask us the right questions and that we are willing to understand. So if we do it like that, we, we come to, to, to a kind of an end point or a point of, of, of no return. And exactly this, this, this point of, of no return is interesting because there we have to, to break or we have to, to open ourselves or we have to discard or um, outlift patterns. Um, only that way, something new can come out. Because if we, we, if we designer have known the outcome before we, have, before we did it, it wouldn't be creative or, or innovative anymore. So this is the force of, 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 
of evolution that, that we move it into to something else or that we can form something. But we cannot only form the world through, through this object like this glass or this memory stick or this car or, or these this houses. We can also form the world through the way we, we're thinking and the way we're speaking. So that means that, that, that thinking and, and speaking is also a sculptural process. And I talk about thinking and, and speaking because there it's very evident that we all follow a lot of automatism or patterns. Um, for example, each day we walk. So like you or like me or like this man here. I, I don't really make a lot of thought of walking, but if I do it, then I, I can imagine how my, my knee is bending and which muscle is involved in, in, in that when I walk and what's coming next. And then I can make some reflection on what that means to you and what that means to me. And then I understand that this is a form. And there are also people who bring form into their walk. We call them dancers. And in a work, I had made some times before. Uh, here we have a, yes, made some time before. I made some thought about killing these patterns or these automatisms. So if you ask in Switzerland a six-year-old child to, to design or to, to paint the house, it would look more or less like the little one on, on, on the left side. So this house is, is, is like a Pavlovian condition. I say house and you have that in your mind or you say house and I have that in my mind. Um, so this symbol house goes into my transformation box and my transformation box turns everything upside down, down and suddenly the house is slided or the windows are auto side match or the, or the roof is a terrace or whatever, or the, the top of the roof is like a pillar or so. So what I want to show is that if, if you change the signifier of, of a word, you can find a new meaning or you can change your point of view of the existing meaning. And I think it's... Um, and I think um, it's really important that we, we, we kill this, this, this automatism, not only that we have something beside us we can think about or we can reflect, um, also because, um, because this, this automatism makes us blind for living. And this is the reason why it helps that, that, we, that we see something flexible and not something fixed in, 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 in the way we think and in the way we're speaking. And if you see like a sculpture, which we, we can always form like this, then, then we can form still a lot and we can also discover a lot. And if we see this through this angle, we can make uh, a poem just with letters, but, but with the same letters we can make philosophy or we can build a social, uh, social system or we can build castle in the air. So we can do a lot. And what, what these words are, are for a, a poet is material for us designer. And when I start with an object, I start with a, a need what I want to do and a, and a vague idea how I can follow this idea. So you can imagine that like you want to clap in, in your hands, but you, you don't know how this works. So the first time you try, probably nothing really happens. So, and sooner or later, uh, a, a finger or so touches your other hand or Probably it's just a wind between your fingers which feeds your vague idea. And at the end, you, your two hands come together and you hear this little sound and then you tune this sound. So this is the kind how I make that. And some times ago, a friend of mine, um, Roland Buzo, it's a, it's a professor of, of astrophysics, uh, had a speech and somebody asked him, why do stars destroy themselves? Why this destructiveness? And his answer is, is really simple. 
because universe is able to do so. And this exactly is the answer because for sure we can follow an idea but we can only materialize it when it's already inherently here so that we can discover it. Because, and, and um, that means that we can only clap in our hand when the system or, or the universe allows it. So, simply said, we need two hands to clap. Because uh, beautiful buildings like the one we've seen from Corbusier or the one from Charot are possible, or we are also able to discover them. But even, even beautiful as, as, as as all this, this uh, object or houses is the possibility that we can change or move patterns. Because there, the thought is, is, is no black or white anymore. And for a friction of a moment, we have this immediacy where, where it has no given value or no meaning. And this is, for me, more sensual than anything on Earth. Now I want to show you one of my work. And yes, look at this paper, for example. Um, can you imagine that this paper becomes to that? And this was my, this was my need. And, and I also had the vague idea how can I make it in, in metal instead of, of paper. To, understand how that works, I have to talk a little bit about material. Um, material is not, material arises. That means that material was, was already something else which went through a, a transformation. And what we design or do is, is, a, is a kind, and this is really interesting, is a kind of mirroring of this process. We produce uh, with material given by nature, new products, so that the original uh, material, let's, let's call it pixie dust, gains another dimension similar to an evolution. That material can arise from pixie dust, um, it needs a, a specific process. And when we analyze this process, we can learn or we, yes, we can learn where and, and how we can form material. So this point is interesting because there we can do something with the material when it becomes malleable or whatever. And as I started with this lamp, I had to, to think about metal. And if you consider this, this metal sheet, it is always more more tension on the surface than in the inner of, of this metal sheet. So this is because of this, of this uh, production process. When you produce a metal sheet, it's cooling out first outside and the inner is still warm and liquid. And when, when metal is warm and liquid, it's bigger. So outside we have already the shape and inside it's cooling out. So we get a lot of tension outside. And my intention was just to destroy this, this, this tension. And I had to make some scratches on, on, on this, this metal sheet. And I had the intention that, that when I do that, that the, the metal will go in this form because of this, this uh, material typical tension. So this is my first prototype. And you can see here these uh, horizontal lines. These are these uh, scraps. And it didn't work. So I had to start to think about metal again. And you can imagine on, on one side a, a very thin metal sheet, like an aluminum foil you can, can pack some, some sandwiches. And this you can form by your hand. Um, imagine on the other side a, a big beam or so. And this beam don't break even if a, if a house is sitting on this, this beam. So we have the same material, but the intensity we have to put into this material is completely different. So with our hands in the, uh, in the shape with the aluminum foil, or with 1,200 degrees the, in, in the beam, that it becomes malleable. And what I 
needed for my lamp is exactly these two properties. I needed these folding properties and I also needed these stable properties. And the solution is at the end really simple. It's, I took just a, a, a big metal sheet which, which uh, is, is stable enough you can't fold by hand and there where you needed these folding parts I thinned it out. And this is uh, at the end is the result when the light is inside. Um, now I want to show you some of my other products but without any comments. So my speech is now finished and I thank you for listening and I hope you know now why we need two hands to, to clap but on the other side it's also very important that we kill automatisms. So I hope this is not a confusion for you. Thank you. Okay, I would say <coughs> a few questions now. I would say... Um, you explained this very, very effectively why you can't find intensity with compromise. Uh, 